Recording live from FYP Studios, transmitting across the internet, this is episode 51 of Registry Matters. Good evening, Larry. How are you? Great, Andy. How are you? I'm doing very well. We, we've had some, like, like what would be considered cold weather. I had frost on my car this morning. Wow, a frost in middle Georgia. Middle Georgia and frost, and then, I don't know, by 8 o'clock the sun was out and the frost was gone. But it was kind of, you know, I mean, that's, that's cold. Well, what they used to do back in my day was the, they would put their greens, their collard greens, out when they were going to have frost. And I didn't quite understand, but it was supposed to enhance the cooking of the of the collards if they got if they were if they were subjected to the frost. I've heard of this. Okay, uh, complete tangent. Since you've brought this up, there was a there was an episode. It was either Science Friday or like the Splendid Table. I think it is uh, NPR cooking show, and they had some guy on there that was talking about growing carrots up in uh, like northern uh, New York. And when they get the cold weather, that stresses the the vegetables, and they have to produce sugar. I'm not really sure, like the me- mechanism behind this, but they produce the sugar, and that gives you sweet carrots. And so he was doing this whole thing, like farming to table, kind of thing, not related. But yes, so it probably makes the collards stress themselves in such a way. I guess it's similar to when you hunt, and if you stress the animal, uh, then it gets a real bitter taste. I think. I didn't. I didn't know that, but yeah, I remember a lot of the older people that were that would cook collards, and for those who are not in the South, that's a staple of the Deep South. It's a green that they that they prepare, and and they just can't do without their collard greens, and and uh, they would put them outside on frost nights and say that they were going to be much better after they had have after they had spent the night in the frost. Interesting. Now here's something else. I, I this just. I, it, this blew my mind when I read it. Um, I saw this on Twitter and I was just scrolling through and someone said, blah, 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 hotel. And they replaced the shower head. And I just was like, I, okay. So somebody goes and travels somewhere. And when they get there, they pull out some hardware and they bring out the shower head and they replace their shower head. And I was just like, huh, who, who would do this sort of thing? Well, I can tell you one person that would do it. I I do it on a regular basis. You what? You no. Yes, I do. I I replace the. It's 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 been an effort of of the hospitality industry for a good number of years now, due to the increasing cost of water and efforts at conservation. That they've put the most restrictive flows in their showers, particularly in the desert uh, areas of, uh, of the country, but but not just the desert areas, the cost of water product commodity has gone up and you'll go to a hotel and you'll have just such a weak flow that you could almost not take a shower, at least a satisfactory shower. So for years and years and years, I've traveled with a shower head. And has the I TSA have... ever looked at you cross? Well, no, they're they're usually plastic, largely plastic, but the the the, the shower head and and a small pair of channel locks and and a <laughs> and a, and a little. I don't. I don't know what is so funny about this. You have to go in there with channel locks to replace this shower head. <laughs> well, it's uh, that, and you. Probably have a little small roll of Teflon tape. And you do bring leak the, tape. Yeah, you bring <laughs> a little tiny roll of leak tape, and all the all the restrictive devices <laughs> of the hotel. You you remove theirs and put your own, and you have a wonderful shower. And then you do the same thing in the in the lavatory because they have those little tiny. Those little tiny spray heads that just splatter out a little smidgen of water, and you take that that one off. They're per, they have universal aerators, and you put yours on, and you you have a nice, wonderful experience. <laughs> and then you you restore it back to the way it was. And and uh, you do this in the sink too. Well, yes, that's that's you, need, you, you do need a you do need a stream of water in the sink. Is there anything else novel that you bring? Oh, I just I gotta I gotta go with this one. This one's too much. <laughs> well, I, it depends on if I'm traveling by air. I, I have to contain some of what I would carry. If I if I'm traveling by air, I would I would I would carry very soft towels because if you're at a hotel, your towels are going to be very seldom use any any fabric softener. So you could 
uh, you could actually peel your skin with the, you'd be better to drive with number 40 grit sandpaper than most of the towels they have. So I would bring my own towels. I would usually bring my own pillow with them if I'm traveling by air. And, and uh, if I'm traveling by car, then I can add additional things like a, like a uh, fan to keep uh, air moving if they have the cycle on and off and they don't have a constant fan. And also it helps to keep down background noise. So you'd have a fan and you would also, you would also uh, consider and the older properties, the, the sinks never drain and you, you'd have a plunger just in case that, that the sink won't drain because inevitably wait, they tell on. you, wait, they, you, you bring, you bring a plunger, like a plunger, I'm, plunger, if, if a I'm stick with by, a little rubber, whatever you want to call it on the end. If of I'm, it. if I'm traveling by car, yes, you, you, if you, if you stay at budget, roadside hotels in the in the seventy five dollar range, often they're older properties and through twenty years of people dumping various things and globs of hair, they drain very slowly. And what you've learned is that housekeepers, they never actually run the water. They take a little sponge and a little squirt bottle and they spray the sink after an overnight and they sponge it. And they don't ever bother to find out if the drain will receive the water at the pace that it's coming down. And so if you turn on the water to shave, the sink will start backing up. It would be a very slow drain. <laughs> and so if you complain to the front desk, they will tell you it's the first they've ever heard of it, that no one has ever complained, and they don't have any rooms to put you in, and they'll roll their eyes, and it's just easier to rectify the problem than it is to try to get them to actually provide you a room that it already has rectified problems. I have I have a question. What would be the uh, the name of the owner of one of these hotels, perhaps? Well, as far as the roadside hotels, they're they're uh, they're mostly owned by uh, people that with uh, with Indian background from, in the very common name like in India is Patel, and they, it would be common to Smith in the United States or Jones or something. But yeah, you'd find a lot of the roadside hotels are are owned by oh, if you if you look around and look who the operator is. It'll be Mr. Patel. It'll and how would that you. sound when you call down the desk? Oh, it would be Mr. Patel. <laughs> <laughs> I can't take it. I can't take it. We have to shut it down. I can't take it. <laughs> but the thing oh about God. Mr. About Mr. Patel is that depending on their value system, they're just like Americans. Some run splendidly well-managed properties and some are very tight and are horrible owners and operators of, of properties, and it just runs the gamut. I've, I've just experienced a, a, from property to property, it varies so much. Uh, Can you remember, give me anything else that's like super duper novel? I mean, I've never ever considered a shower head, a sink, uh, whatever doohickey. I, I've heard people bringing their own towels, you know, maybe you bring a robe, you bring your own pillow, whatever. That, that doesn't seem that weird. Do you bring your own mop, dustpan, uh, vacuum cleaner? Uh, I haven't gone to that extreme yet. I, I I would probably tell them the room was unacceptable if it needed. If it needed. <laughs> this is the weirdest thing. I'm sorry to everybody for me just sitting over here giggling because this is well, the funniest thing I've ever heard. Well, I can't believe you haven't heard of more people doing this. It would seem kind of normal to me if you're a regular traveler that you would be prepared. Uh, uh, maybe you're the only one that it's that big of a deal to. Maybe. I don't know. Well, uh, well, when... When you check into a room, I have a I have a ritual of inspection I do, and I try to eliminate problems. Because see, the problem, many people shower in the morning, and if you have no water pressure, if the if the if the drains don't work, they act like you're trying to get a free night. Because they'll say, "Well, you didn't mention it until check it." Well, of course, you didn't know till hour before you leave when you took your yeah, shower. Sure, 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 sure. But 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 uh, so I go in the room. And I turn on the air conditioner to see if it's going to make the god awful roar. Because the older they get, those units, when the compressor kicks in, you hear the roar and the vibration. So I'll turn on that to make sure it's not going to be roaring. I'll run the water to see if the drain is going to receive it. I'll I'll do I'll do a checklist to see if the room appears it's going to be satisfactory. And if you're if you're a regular traveler and you don't sleep very well, you look for key things that are going to be a problem. If, if they put you next to the elevator, if they put you facing the railroad tracks, uh, you, 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 you will probably go to the other side of the hotel. So you, you try to eliminate the things right away before you've actually disturbed anything in the room. Because once you've been in the room for an hour, you've sat down and you've put some popcorn in the oven and you've done all these things, they can't re-rent the room because housekeeping has gone home. So it's best to check the room 
and see if it meets your needs and have the discussion before before you actually disturb it because the next person that comes along is not going to be like you and they'll be happy to have the room with the freight train going by and with no water coming out of the sink and the water not draining and all that stuff doesn't bother a lot of people so they can still rent the room if you don't disturb anything. I just can only then add that you are a peculiar individual. That's all I got. I don't, I don't disagree so. with your logic, but you're peculiar. I, I just I think I don't understand why everybody wouldn't do it. Wow. All right. Are you, uh, are you ready to cover some articles with some, with some expert witness opinion here? I thought this was registry matters and we spent a half an hour talking about hotels. I know. Here's, here's, here's your travel tips for the week, you guys. <laughs> wow. That, um, that was, I can't even imagine that. That's just bizarre. All right. Well, this, I, I don't even, this doesn't even really make sense. The, Ohio, the Idaho statesman is covering an article out of North Carolina. North Carolina um, High Court weighs if sex, tra- uh, excuse me, if tracking sex offenders is reasonable. And they cover that in the article, they say that about three or, or so years ago, the Supreme Court said, well, duh, having a GPS uh, ankle monitor or whatever on you is definitely like a search. So I guess then North Carolina has written laws that say if you are uh, certain kinds of sex offenders that you get to wear lifetime GPS monitoring. I haven't really followed this as closely since the per curiam ruling issued by the Supreme Court a few years back. I know that that they just laughed at the state's response when when the state said that this is not a search, and they said, of course it is. It's a search and a seizure, and uh, you 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 need to go back and 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 rather than summarily blowing this case out of the water, you need to you need to go back and actually analyze it on the merits. So this case is now back in the state court system. Uh, and I would like to I'd like to put this on our schedule for a future podcast. But okay. there's no doubt there's no doubt about when they attach a GPS device. And I don't like for here that the person's wearing a GPS because you wear bracelets and you wear watches and you wear jewelry, but you, you don't wear a GPS in the little sense yeah. of wearing it. It's, it's fastened to you. Oftentimes it's too tight for you. You can't put your sock under it. Uh, you, your your skin is rash, getting a rash because of the thing uh, moving around. Uh, you have to be so many feet from a electrical outlet at all times because it needs to be charged. It's very very debilitating, and of course everyone knows when you're in a public building where there's where there's a uh, security that you're under some type of correctional supervision. The private sector doesn't attach the GPSs to people's bodies. They put them in their telephones and things, but they don't attach them to their bodies. So if you have one of those attached to your body, you can rest assured that the person is under correctional supervision of some type. And, yeah. And and, hey. and 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 to give us a little bit of more feedback on that, uh, we have uh, Laura joining us and she wore one for a year. Yes. Could you could you tell us I mean First, let me ask the dumb question. Was it comfortable? No, it was very uncomfortable. <clears throat> um, during the summer, my ankles would swell and the monitor would get so tight it would leave an impression on my on my ankle. You would end up with like an indentation? Yes. That's pretty awful. Um were you living like within a pretty big population center where there were cell towers everywhere or were you out in the boonies where reception was pretty weak? For about um, seven of the months that I had it on, I was in a place where reception was pretty weak. There were no cell towers. So that caused um, a big headache. Um, a p- headache? Why? Well, there is... It, it had a problem getting a signal just as a cell phone would have a problem getting a signal. So I was constantly getting calls from my probation officer probably every other day wanting me to walk outside, go to the road, try to get a signal. And so this was very frustrating. And because there was no signal most of the time, it was having to work overtime to, to you know to keep a signal going and so therefore the charge on it would go down i couldn't plan to go anywhere for a length of time because 
there was no charge. So I was constantly just tethered to the charger. And when I say constantly, I mean probably about 10 hours a day I was on this charger. (laughs) You were tethered to a USB power cord or whatever for 10 hours a day? Correct. That's ridiculous. That's one of the more bizarre stories I've heard about about the GPS. uh, Charging is an issue, but uh, there's the earlier versions were passive downloads, meaning they collected the data and then they downloaded them. So the person would, would take the box that they carried on their person and then the ankle part that was attached to their, to their, to their ankle, then they would take that uh, box and they would put it into a, a unit where it could download on the old fashioned phone and give them the data. And uh, th- that you would usually be able to run all day on an overnight charge but this was a new, t- a new territory, new, new stuff for me. That that uh, that the thing was working so hard that it could that it couldn't keep a charge. So therefore, the only way she could stay in compliance would be to stay on a charger. That's that's uh, that's buzz- bizarre. It would certainly interfere with a person's working and and uh, reintegration. I would say if you're tethered to a charger all the time. Mm-hmm. It it made everything difficult. I remember going out sometimes, and I would have to find a a public restroom or somewhere where there was a charger and just sit there and charge before I could, could leave because the light was turning red and I did not want to get another call from my probation officer saying, where are you? Your monitor's dead. Well, do, 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 uh, do uh, people in public restrooms uh, look at you a little strange when you're sitting on the toilet with your, with wires going everywhere? Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. I was just going there. I was just about to go there. <laughs> So uh, I would imagine that uh, that would be a very, uh, very difficult, no matter where you are, if you try to plug something that's attached to your ankle. And they're used to seeing cell phones and, and various computer devices, but I'm not sure they're used to seeing people's ankles plugged into everything. Did you have to pay for this? Uh, no, I did not. Um, I'm on federal probation. I know a lot of people on state do have to pay for it, and it could be, you know, upwards of, Fifteen twenty dollars a day. Wow. Yeah, that's, I think. Yeah, I, I was I was reading something earlier today, and it was talking about twenty five and change per day for for uh, some sort of GPS monitoring. Wow, it's crazy. Wow. Uh, is there anything else that you'd like to add about it? Um, it caused me to have injuries a few times. I tell me about that. Um, three times in particular, I was getting out of a SUV, and it got caught, you know, there's a little step. It got caught on that step and caused me to fall, bruised my ankle up fairly bad. And the other two times coming downstairs, um, one set of stairs, when I go down it, it would hit the stairs every time unless I was really careful. Well, I was coming down one morning and wasn't really paying attention and it hit hard and there my ankles bruised and messed up again. Hmm. So and the same with the other time, it just, it would get caught on something or, or hit something. And, and you <clears throat> talked about the uh, summertime a minute ago, uh, you know, Georgia, it's, it's pretty freaking hot in the summertime and you're wearing shorts and you've got this big box coming off your leg. Right. Um, every that now doesn't and then look I'd, you know, out of place. Wrap something, every now and then I'd wrap something around it and, you know, put a little bow or something, but <laughs> you, know, or... you, you know how, like in uh, in grade school or whatever, you break a, you break your arm and you go ahead. I was just saying, like I'm trying to make some new fashion statement. You know? <laughs> well, I was just going to so so grammar school, you break a you break your arm or something, and everybody's decorating your cast. Did you ever think about painting it or coloring it in any way? Oh, well, my daughter, she put little stickers all over it one day. Oh, my God. <laughs> well, huh. Hello, kitty. <laughs> of course, the PO says, why do you have children's stickers on your monitor? You need to take those off. I, I mean, that, 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 that paints a pretty clear picture of, of the intrusion level that it does provide. I don't have much else to, to get into. It's, it's, it's just new new stuff that I didn't didn't have in terms of the GPS. I know I know that it's supposed to be the end all cure all and it's not. And I've expressed it on these podcasts that 
a GPS can have an appropriate part of the criminal justice system. And in my view, that's very limited. It would be in cases where a person has violated the terms of supervision, and this would be something short of putting them back behind the walls. We would say, well, you, you're having boundary troubles. You don't respect your curfew, so we're going to make sure we're tracking you, that you are abiding by your curfew. Uh, people who have boundary issues that can't respect exclusion zones, if you if you domestic violence is a fine example of that. People people are told to stay away from their victim. This is this is a boundary control device in terms of that. Uh, there's there there are appropriate places where a GPS could be used as a sanction for for bad behavior while under supervision, short of putting them behind the walls. But to arbitrarily put this on everybody, attach these devices to everyone's body because they have a sex related conviction while they're under supervision is a waste of resources and it's a misguided policy in my view. And unfortunately. In my state, they're doing a heck of a lot of it. And it shifts the cost down to, I mean, often, I mean, not in Laura's case, but it shifts the cost down to the person. I mean, when you go behind the, behind the wall in the cage, you, you know, you're not necessarily paying for it, but I think they're trying to introduce that in some places. But for other people, you're paying something, 10, 20 something dollars a day for some level of freedom. And that guy, what is that? $500 a month? It would it would be one of those things that would make uh, community supervision insurmountable for many because the low paying jobs don't provide a cushion of that level for yeah. people when you're earning the federal minimum wage of seven twenty five an hour and even if you're a dollar or two above that you're still at very low wage levels to be able to sustain GPS costs treatment costs uh, for counseling. And uh, it, it, it's, it, and if you have uh, most states pile a bunch of, uh, of fines and court costs and restitution on the federal system, to its credit, it's not nearly as bad. The, 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 the fines are really not a problem. What, where you get into in the federal system is for the, uh, for the possession of images. If, if the, the victim can come back and, and claim damages, uh, and that can be significant. But as far as fines, and and you don't see a lot of huge penalty. I think the federal penalty assessment is like twenty five dollars. Laura, can you collect, correct me on that? If it, when you look at your judgment, it says that there was a penalty assessment of twenty five dollars levied, and it's, it's been a, stuck. A hundred dollars. Is it a hundred dollars now? Yes. Yeah. So it, it's uh, but over the course of your of your supervision, you've you know you've got a hundred dollars. It's not an astronomical sum of money. Well, thank you very much for joining us, Laura, on short notice especially, and uh, putting up with technical troubles to to be a day behind schedule, and really greatly appreciate it very much. Thank you for your insight. Thank you. I was glad to be here. Thanks, Laura. Thank you. Well, this next article then comes from the Independent Women's Forum, iwf.org, and this goes to the whole campus allegations of sexual misconduct stuff where someone says they did something, someone says they didn't do something. How do you bring some level of security, safety, due process, and all the stuff onto the college campus? I think the college campus generally has the uh, frame of mind that they want to no cross-examining, no facing your accuser, basically take one person's side of the story, and that becomes what the fact is, I guess is one way to put it. Unfortunately, that did become reality under the Obama administration with the guidance they gave the universities in terms of how to handle assault investigations. And they forgot all about the presumption of innocence and the right to due process and confrontation. And I think our, we have another article where where we're going to get to uh, where the uh, education department under Betsy DeVos is trying to re- reinstitute that balance between the accuser and the accused. And, but yes, this is, this is where the uh, rabid, some of the more rabid victims advocates would lead us. Uh, if we, if we, if we let them have their way, uh, you just assume that the accusation is true and you levy the maximum penalty in terms of the administrative stuff. But what we're talking about usually happens is these universities expel them from class, ex- from the, right. from the, uh, from the university environment. So regardless of how far you are into your academic career, you get this blemish on your transcript and you get dropped from the university. And there was no due process before that happened. That is that the America that 
that we want. Right. Yeah. I, and some time ago, not too long ago, we covered something. I think the kid, the, the male was a handful of months away from finishing his uh, his program. And now he gets removed from campus. Now he's got to go ra- try and find another campus that'll take him. Now he's got this on his record. Then it makes it hard for him to get a degree that he's paid, I don't know, 40, 100 grand for. And now he can't even finish it. He's two credit shy or something like that. Um. And in this case, the title of the article is Some American University Students Find Mere Mention of Due Process Threatening. Uh, I, I do see how that is a significant problem. Uh, I, that is one of like the bedrocks of our judicial system. Absolutely. And, and I've, uh, I'm not going to name any of my elected officials in my state, but I've had those conversations. And, and it, it's frightening to me that, that some people that are elected Take that view that 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 due process is is not appropriate uh, for this situation, and I'm saying, really, you you're, you don't believe that due process should be afforded because of the severity of the accusations. That's frightening, right? It, it, Which would that go ahead? I, I do understand that in cases where there has been a sexual assault. Of some of of some significance. Now, I don't consider some things, and I don't want to go down this rabbit hole of what constitutes sexual assault. But I do think that people have buyer's remorse, and I think I'll leave it at that. But in cases where it's clear cut, it would be a very uncomfortable for the person who had been assaulted to be on campus with a person. But that's the reality of our system in America. That would go forth in any type of criminality, since there's a presumption of innocence. It doesn't matter if they've driv- driven drunk and they've killed your loved one. While they're waiting the, for the process to work, the presumption follows them all the way to the end of that process. And it may bother you that they're out on the street still driving, but that's what they're allowed to do with the U.S. of A. Which would then tie into the next article that comes from NPR, and it is Education Department Proposes Enhanced Protection for Students Accused of Sexual Assault. And this is uh, really not my favorite person, Betsy DeVos, but she is the uh, uh, the Trump administration education secretary. And she is uh, what would appear to be establishing much more uh, a fair set pro- of processes to allow that the accused has some some level of ground to stand on to protect themselves from I mean because otherwise people could just make allegations all day long and get everyone removed from a campus. I'm not saying that they would, just saying that the opportunity is there if you're only going to hear one side of the argument. So this puts something more back in line with there being protection for the accused. And as as I've done several times before, when they were studying these uh, changing guidelines. I said I was supportive of the changes that I was hearing that they were looking at. I remain supportive. Uh, I think that that this is long overdue, and I did not find the actions of the previous administration to be consistent with, with what I believe our country stands for when it is due process being denied. Due process is something we fight for, and I would fight for, for those who here are in our country that may not be citizens. I know that's an unpopular thing. They're entitled to a due process under, under treaties we've made and, uh, uh, and also under our own law. And it's easy to say the hell with due process. You certainly get more rapid conclusions to situations, but is that the country you want to live in? Because the next person who's denied due process may be you. And in the article, it says the Obama administration directed schools to minimize the burden on the complainant. And that's uh, that's what we're talking about here is the person making the accusation should not be traumatized in any way, should not be cross-examined. Just take them at their word and run with it, I guess. That is best I could understand their guidance was their uh, That's what they were doing. And I can't I can't be supportive of that. But it's due process that I believe in. It's not just an art issue. It's due process for even others who you disagree with, who you don't feel particular sympathy for. Due process is due process. And uh, I'll even stretch it out a little bit further because people are probably familiar with the uh, CNN reporter. 
uh, the uh, what's his name that had his uh, credential uh, revoked by the White House? Jim Jim Acosta. Well, Acosta had his credential uh, revoked, and unfortunately, there was a lack of due process, and a and a federal judge appointed by President Trump has said, no, you can't do that without due process. And that's that's a good thing that due process is relevant. Now, I've also said in private conversations, and I'll say it on the podcast tonight, that there's nowhere in the Constitution that the White House that I'm aware of must give access to the press. It's a relevant Yeah, I was going to ask you that. I was, I was, I was, I was going to challenge you on that one. I mean, they are there at the, uh, what's the word, at the privilege of the, of the White House in general. So I'm assuming that anybody could be removed from there at will. They only allow certain credentials. Well, apparently there's a case uh, that I have not read that says since they do allow press, that in order to revoke that privilege, they have to go about doing it. It's kind of like driving is a privilege. But to revoke your driving privilege, there's a process attached to it. You may have had too many tickets within a period of time. You may have gotten a DWI or DUI, as they call it in your state. But there's a process to where you can challenge the suspension of that privilege. Um, And the president, in my view, doesn't have to allow as much access as they allow in the White House for the press corps. But they do. And removing Acosta without any process at all is problematic. But the, the judge has not ruled on whether they, they all he's ru- uh, ruling ruled on was due process was not granted to Acosta. He doesn't say that after the due process that, that he, his credential can't be revoked at that point because there are always with cause. And it may be that after a process takes place, that the cause will be sufficient to, to revoke his credential. And, and we're off a little bit off topic, but just two points that I'd like to make about that. Jim Acosta sits pretty far up in the front of the press corps which I think means he's a fairly senior-ish kind of reporter person to be in that spot. And the second one is that the White House released doctored video. That, that, that's the one that really bothers me. Well, he would be the networks, uh, the way they, they, they have that seniority system, and they, they, he would be like, like one of the, one of the uh, senior people like, uh, in, the, in, the, in the press corps. But I don't know anything about the doctored video. I know I've heard about it. Uh, I don't know why you would need to doctor the video because the video was pretty obvious. There was there were hands touching without doctoring it. Acosta was trying to keep the microphone. The intern was trying to get the microphone back, and if it was it, it was it wasn't his microphone to have. Right, but if you change the order of events that she reached first, if you change the order of events and blur her hand, then it makes it look like he sort of like karate chopped her elbow. Right, but I'm saying you don't really don't need to do that because. When your time is up with the mic, it's kind of like our microphone sure. for the conference. When we get ready to take the microphone back, it's our microphone. And Acosta didn't own the microphone. His time had, uh, the president had told him his time was up, that he didn't choose to uh, to address him any further. And at that point, even though you disagree with the president, sure. you surrender to the microphone. Yeah, no, I, view, I, anyway. I think so. And, and he had, he was like, but yeah, I, yeah, we could we could quibble about that all day. But yeah, so anywho. That, you're back to the due process issue. Yeah, I, 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 that was on the point for that, not to get political about Trump, but due process. I'm a believer that processes must be followed. And before something is taken, there has to be some due process. And, and, and taking people out of the university setting without due process is problematic. And I'm glad the administration has recognized that. And I'm giving them kudos multiple times for it. Right, 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 right. Ready to be a part of Registry Matters? Get links at registrymatters.co. If you need to be all discreet about it, contact them by email, registrymatterscast at gmail.com. You can call or text a ransom message to 747-227-4477. Want to support Registry Matters on a monthly basis? Head to patreon.com slash registrymatters. Not ready to become a patron? Give a five-star review at Apple Podcasts or Stitcher, or tell your buddies at your treatment class about the podcast. We want to send out a big heartfelt support for those on the registry. Keep fighting. Without you, we can't succeed. You make it possible. Um, and let's, uh, so we have, uh, we have this, and then we have one other topic, and I, I, we had some technical problems, so I'm not really sure if this is running short or long, because we recorded about 20 ish minutes last night and then your your headset sort of failed out on us and now we're under new equipment i don't know where we left off but 
Um, well, what we, do we, have an article. What, we, what we had was a person who had a microphone for six months <laughs> that never set it up. That's more of a broadcast quality because that person was comfortable using the headset. And then the headset developed uh, issues and the person didn't know how to set up his microphone and had to get some help. So now we think we have the microphone set up. (laughs) (laughs) Um, But uh, anyway, so I don't know where we are in the time of things. We also have a, we, this article comes from the Hill and this is about a criminal justice reform bill that uh, is being looked at in the Senate, but kind of looking at criminal justice reform after the midterms. And this is interesting because there's like an evolving uh, set of terms going on here. I knew that I'd heard this. And so Mitch McConnell, Mitch McConnell has said that if there's 60 votes on the floor, that he is willing to bring this to the, uh, to, to bring it to a vote. This is something that is a pretty high priority for Jared Kushner, who is the son-in-law of the president. But, and we have a pretty long audio clip and I'm not really sure that I can do a whole lot to shorten it down. But we well, have a uh, we have a, we'll go how, ahead. What? How long how long is that clip? Because I know the whole segment is about nineteen minutes, so we don't want to play that. No, no, it's three minutes long. It's about two thirty. Okay, uh, okay. And then there was the 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 Times article about how how this bill has been watered down. To what's now emerged as a compromise bill. Uh, so we don't we don't have a real strong reform bill, but we do have a reform bill that's ready for a vote. Sure. So let's hear Lindsey Graham uh, talking on, uh, I think they call it Press the Meat or Meet the Press as meet, it is. Meet, meet, the, meet the Press. <laughs> this one, well, let's, let's build the foundation for it because I know Go ahead. people sometimes believe that that I'm just too partisan because uh, in 2016, we had a reform bill at the federal level. And remember, uh, folks, these reforms at the federal level only affect those co- who've committed and been convicted of federal crimes. So your state prison system will remain, remain the same as it is now. But what I've said is in 2016 that that there was bipartisan movement to reform the federal prison system to have fewer people in prison. And in mid-2016, in the heat of the uh, campaign, the Republicans got cold feet because candidate Trump wanted to be the law and order president. And therefore, they backed away and the bill died. And here we sit two years later, where another reform bill that has bipartisan support, bipartisan support has made it through the process, except it needs to be agreed to by the Senate. And the the Senate uh, uh, majority leader, Mitch McConnell from Kentucky, had promised, as it was reported, that he would take up this after the midterms because his caucus is not completely unanimous. The Democratic caucus is pretty much unanimous. Everybody wants to vote to, re- to reform the system. Well, now he's saying that he doesn't want to take the vote up in what's referred to as the lame duck session. And there is a, a significant bipartisan support in the Senate of the, of the, of the uh, 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 hundred senators. So Senator Lindsey Graham appeared on Meet the Press today, and he talked about that. And that's the clip that we're going to play. All right, so here is a clip from Meet the Press. It's like I said, 2.30. If you need me to stop, Larry, just call it, and then we can pause it and keep going. Okay. Do you believe the majority leader is trying to quietly kill this bill in the lame duck? Uh, No, not really, because uh, Tom Cotton's had this view from day one. What we're talking about is uh, basically creating a new sentencing system that will give African-American male and Hispanic male uh, uh, detainees a chance to get out of jail, earning their way out of jail. They've been in jail 30, 40 years for three nonviolent drug related offenses and change our sentencing system. To, to, to make it more humane and more productive. Tom has been on the other side of this. There's 80 votes for this. It's the most important bipartisan piece of legislation in the Congress today. It would make prisons a, a better place to get people the skills they need to not go back to prison 
and it will also change the way we we'll put people in jail. The average sentence in America is eight times higher than anywhere else in the world. For nonviolent offenders, we've got people in jail for 30 and 40 years. Some of them need to get out of jail and go back to work. And I'm urging Mitch McConnell, put this bill on the floor. If you put it on the floor, we'll get 80 votes. We'll get most Republicans and almost all Democrats. And let's do it before the end of the year and the president's behind it. So, Mr. President, pick up the phone and call the Republican leadership of the House and the Senate and say we still run this place. Bring this bill to the floor. Senator Cotton can have his say and we'll vote him down. But this you believe the president is going to have to start lobbying Mitch McConnell because you guys have done everything you could and you haven't been able to get him to budge. Yeah, you know what? The country needs to heal here. And one way to bring this country together after the the midterms is to focus on something that matters. I never dreamed that this many Republicans and Democrats would embrace sentencing reform and prison reform. Three strikes and you out has not worked. Now's the time to get it right. Let's start 2019 on a positive note. I'm urging Senator McConnell to bring the bill to the floor of the Senate. It will get 80 votes. Mr. President, pick up the phone and push the Republican leadership. The Republicans are the problem here not the Democrats. Uh, Cory Booker has been very helpful in getting us to yes. There's been some compromises to keep it from being a jailbreak. Yep. So I'm ready to vote. Senator Lindsey Graham, you had your caffeine this morning, sir. Uh, <laughs> yeah, much appreciated. <laughs> okay. oh, always fun Thank to have you. you on and have you share your views. Thank you, sir. Have a good Thank Thanksgiving. You, I know that you wanted to key in there that the Republicans are at fault here. I did do that, Andy. I wanted to do that because, like I said, I know that I get a lot of grief for people thinking that I'm 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 about public policy, and I'll ride the train of anybody who's on the right side of good public policy. And as I've said throughout this podcast history, that we're being stymied by the Republican Party on reform. And if if so many of our people are Republicans, this is an opportunity, particularly if you live in Kentucky to call Senator McConnell and say, let's get this done. Because you don't have to take my word. Senator Senator Lindsey Graham is telling you that the Democrats are not the problem. He's telling you where the problem lies. So let's see if we can get the problem cured and get this thing done. And he's not, you know, he's not a freshman senator, right? No, he's not. He's, uh, I mean, he's really high up on the food chain is really what I'm saying. He's been around a while and he's well respected and, and uh, he's particularly in the area of foreign relations, but he has, he has uh, expertise in a number of areas. And, and uh, he, he's, he's, uh, he, when he's talking about Tom Cotton, he's talking about, he's a Senator from Arkansas. And apparently Tom Cotton doesn't feel that this is a, a good public policy. Well, Tom can vote against it, but as he said, 80 are going to vote for it. Let's get it done. And, you know, and, and as we're talking about, so like you know, recently Kavanaugh got put in like with what, 51 votes, I mean, that's, you know, it's the slimmest of slim majorities at 80 is, you know, you don't, you don't, you don't, you can't really quibble about having a problem with 80 votes. You could argue about the margins of who did and who didn't, but 80 is a really strong majority. I mean, that's obviously 80%. Yeah. Four, four fifths of the, of the Senator or for this. And one person from Kentucky that can decide to have a vote. And, and, and if, if there's a filibuster attempted, since if, if uh, Senator Graham is correct, there's 80 votes, they could quickly break the filibuster. Hmm. Interesting. And is, th- is this the First Step Act or is this something different? This is, this is no, this is, this is a, a broader reform bill. Like he was talking about the three strikes and the, the disparity on the crack and the, the, the powder uh, this this is this is this actually was a very broad reform bill, but it has been reduced, and I can't cite the specifics because oh, fine. these things become hundreds of pages long, and and no one knows what's in them except for yeah. the people that are closest to the to the to the action. But if anybody who's followed it more closely wants to write us and contact us, uh, we'll be happy to have you come on in the next podcast or the future one, and hopefully by then we'll have some direction on if they're going to be able to do this before the before 2018 ends. Can you talk, David? Yeah, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Yeah, I'm on the Samsung, not the iPhone. Oh, see, that uh, fixes everything. Get rid of iPhone, everything. Get rid of Mac, everything. Everything just works better. Yeah, it does. Um, I've been through <laughs> hell. For the, um, you, you, you know I've been through hell. I, I've been through surgery, chemo, uh, a lot of stuff here lately. Um, you did tell me that a month or so ago when we were talking. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm just now coming out of it. Okay. Um, 
uh, I'm, I'm having a problem with the BA, and this is probably not the forum to talk to Larry about it, um, with some of the issues that I'm having with the uh, repercussions of chemo. So I don't know if, if it's the right time to talk to Larry about this kind of legal uh, issues. But to me, it, in, my little, in my little world, it's a big thing. Well, no, no, of course, of course, all of these things are, are big in your own little neighborhood. But, you know, I mean, what the podcast in general is about the, uh, the I register. Understand. Yeah, I know. Um, I know. Larry, do you have any expertise in that department? Not very much. I, I know I hear the horror stories of the VA and I hear good things about the VA and, and I, I, I don't don't know enough about I, I always tend to try to when people call here, I try to push them off to the to the federal branch of government where the VA is, is underneath and see if they're, they're a representative or a senator, one of their uh, U.S. senators or their U.S. representative will help them with their issues with the VA. What, what, what is the issue specifically, if you can succinctly say what, what, what the issue is? Well, um, I've been emailing Rand Paul. You know, I, I, yes, I am in Kentucky, by the way, with McConnell. Um, the, the problem I'm having is with the, um, the nausea that you, you get from chemo, uh, which is a real deal. Um, I've heard that. Yep. And uh, and I told them that uh, uh, marijuana works, and they're giving me the all the medication is not working, and they told me if I smoke marijuana, that uh, they will not give me the medication uh, for all the rest of my chemo on the VA. They threw me under the bus on that, and I haven't, but. Uh, I think that's terrible, wrong, because it does work. Is it is it legal in your state? No, it's legal thirteen miles away, but not here. <laughs> so, so which 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 state is it legal in that's nearby you? Missouri. So um, we they just we, passed it. They just passed it. You know, Andy, this gives me a chance to talk about something that happened at, at the uh, exhibit in Las Vegas. I was somehow going to see if we could tie it into what you told me earlier today. <laughs> oh, because I was uh, at the National Association of Criminal Defense Lawyers uh, Defending Sexual Assault Conference in Las Vegas. And I was interacting with a young young man, probably in his mid to late 20s. And uh, he was there for a different conference. But when Vegas, you run into people that are there for it's a big conference town, and he was there for a different conference. He was there for a marijuana legalization conference, and he was telling me that uh, he was, uh, uh, I just assumed that he was a Democrat because more Democrats are in favor of decriminalization, legalization of marijuana, and removing it from the Schedule One narcotics at the federal level, which is a big problem. And uh, so even the states that, that, uh, that legalize it they run into problems from the feds because they can't access the banking system. Federally regulated banks are, are reluctant to, to allow uh, a banking with, uh, with a non, with something that's criminal at, on the federal side. And uh, so I, I asked him, I said, well, I'm assuming you're happy about the election. I said, I, I, I mistakenly assumed when he said Kansas city was from Kansas and some, a few Democrats got elected in that red state. And he quickly corrected me and he says, well, I'm a Republican. And I said, well, didn't you just tell me you're here on the marijuana legalization? And he said, yes. And I said, well, you do realize that the Republicans, the overwhelming majority of them are against legalization of marijuana. And he said, no, I don't accept that. He said, that's your opinion. I said, no, it's not my opinion. It is the reality of the situation. You'll run into a Rand Paul that may be the exception, but the overwhelming number of elected Republicans, state or federal, are against legalization. And, and and it's it's moving slowly, glacially slow that they're 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 uh, they're uh, decriminalizing uh, uh, the medicinal use, and the, the 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 tide is turning. But he assured me that he was happy to have Claire McCaskill out, and he was happy to have uh, Holly in, and that, that that he was a good man. And I said, well, did you find out what his position was on taking marijuana off the Schedule One list of narcotics? And he said, no, it doesn't matter. He said he's a good man. And I said, well, you're here on the dope legalization conference and you don't know 
the person you elected to the Senate's position on legalization. And of course, he ended the conversation right after that because I was being an a-hole as far as he was concerned. But the point is that sometimes we have to do an analysis of what our issues are, and we need to stop voting for people who are against our positions if we expect to advance our positions. And that frustrates me a lot with our cause because people go ahead and vote for the folks who are in opposition to what we say we're for. And and that was an example of that when it comes to marijuana legalization. Well, doesn't this isn't this exactly where people just vote red, team red, team blue? They don't care. It's like Republicans are bad, Democrats are bad. I have to vote for the other guy because they're just bad, and they never even considered uh, what the necessary the, what the policies are. I think that's a lot of it. And I think also they like people personally, and personality should not influence your vote on public policy, but we're human and it, and it does. If a person has a likable personality and they come across as warm and they connect with folks, you tend to want to vote with them. Reagan would be an example of that. A lot of folks just liked Ronald Reagan. When you ask them about the, about the, the policies of Reagan, they'd say, well, I don't agree with that and I don't agree with that. And they'd go around a list of things they didn't agree with, but they liked the man. And I think that it, it's a combination of voting red, voting blue, and also voting for people that you like because they have a nice personality. Well, but David, you're talking about medicinal, not just recreational, right? Absolutely. Well, you're going to have to get it passed in Kentucky as a step one because I can't see that, that, that they're going to let you uh, have access to something that's against federal and, and state law. I, I, that bat would be my hunch is that – yeah, well, the thing is that the, the VA, well, I don't want to go all into it, but um, it's, um, you know, I don't, I, I don't know why it, it's so hard to, to have something for, especially in chemo and, 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 and all the other stuff. It, it's proven fact that it works. And um, it's, it's, you know, now the governor in uh, Kentucky is all for it, but the legislators are against it. And, and I, and, and I contacted the legislators and a matter of fact, I was on a, um, what do they call those things where, um, where the legislators get on their, uh, the, the home, you know, whatever they call that thing. And, um, and I, when I wanted to ask them about um, medical marijuana and they didn't put me in the queue. Um, so but under why? I don't know. It was a, it was a perfect question. You know, I want to know where he stood on that. You know, on that because um, now I mean the governor's for it. He'll sign it, but the legislators are are fighting it. Now, now so, you're talking about the, the current governor, Matt Bevin. Yes. Okay. So I, did, 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 I Kentucky, know did Kentucky elect a new governor this year, or or, or, or was no, 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 no? He's, he's two years out. He's two years out. Okay. Well then. Then that means Kentuckians, if that is not what they want, then I would say you need to change your legislature. You need to bring some more progressive people in there because if they're not representing the will of Kentucky, then it's time for them to go. Yeah, I, I, I agree. But it doesn't do me no good right now. Not when I'm throwing up every five minutes. Uh, but, no, I mean, this This is something that I think in the 14 election in Georgia, there was a man whose story was something along the lines of his daughter had really, 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 really horrendous seizures. And the only way that he the only way that he found all the different medicines, nothing worked was to get marijuana illegal in Georgia. At that point, they couldn't even get it passed to just get, you know, the oils, the medicinal side of it. I just I. And they couldn't get it passed. So now the guy is forced to go someplace where it's legal. So he's now forced to go like someplace like Colorado where it was. Now you're forcing the man to go into some level of drug trafficking to have his daughter not have seizures. And I can't comprehend how we as a society allow that to happen from something that is, for the most part, it's like naturally grown, et cetera, and all that. But that that's where people stand. They They say that drugs are bad. Marijuana is a gateway drug. End of conversation, whether that's for medicinal or for, I mean, just the, the, the recently outgoing attorney general, that's what he would say. Well, well you know I'm, what's crazy is the doctor agrees with me. So, <laughs> well, I'm going to give you the, the, just this uh, bit of information for the benefit of the podcast listeners. Your current legislative makeup, your Senate has 38 members, 27 of them are Republicans and 11 are Democrats. 
I just about bet you if you start contacting those Democrats, they'll tell you that they're for it. But 11 is not 27 because you, you have nowhere near the ability to pass something as a Democrat. Your House has 100 members, 63% of them, 63 are Republican and 36 are Democrat. I just about bet if you contact any of those, you can just pick random Democrats and contact them. And I bet you'll find almost all of them support either medicinal or recreational marijuana. And I bet you'll find that the overwhelming majority of Republicans don't. And just like we talked about in the previous segment about the criminal justice reform, this is a problem because the Republicans have not come over in terms of adjusting their views to reflect the evolving views of society. And they've, they've disconnected from their constituents. It's more older people. It, like in my state, we have medicinal use of marijuana. We don't have recreational. The people, the people that are using the marijuana are not the kids. They're not the 20-year-olds. It's the people Absolutely. my age that, that are 16, 17, 80 years old. That's the people who are using it. And those, yeah, are, the, and those are the conservative people that are electing these conservative uh, 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 representatives, and they're not communicating to them, hey, you're out of touch with us. We need this. Well, and look we, at Florida, where they have passed, they passed medical marijuana. Uh, it was it passed sixty eight percent. Well, but that was on a public referendum. <laughs> yes, it was. Um, but it still, yeah, I, just, I just looked. I just looked it up. It's like sixty over, way over sixty percent of the U.S. population supports it. But you still have a handful of holdouts. Call it the the conservative base that is so vehemently against it that it's not going to pass in any any conservative kind of state. It's just the end of that I story. Know. Well, but what the VA is saying is, if I do smoke pot and i test positive they're gonna they're gonna, they're gonna pull all my medications and, and that's your issue you feel like that you should be able to fail a drug test of a of a schedule one federal drug that's on the schedule one list and, and because it's for for it's not for your enjoyment it's to 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 to, to get, provide you medical relief and that's that's your real issue with the va they shouldn't be able to do that absolutely well uh tell president trump that <laughs> I, I know. Matter of fact, I did send him a, send, send him an email. <laughs> yeah, tell, tell because we need to get to get that off the schedule one list. We need an act of Congress, and it's going to be the same thing with 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 the with the Democrats control of the House. You might be able. It's a very slim majority. It's not a huge majority. You might be able to get it through the House, but you've also got to get it through the Senate, and you've got to get a president. What, what does the Farm Bill have to do with this? I don't know. I think it takes it off of Schedule 1, doesn't it? I have not heard that. But okay. again, a podcast listener that knows more about the Farm Bill, if there's something related to marijuana, I'd be happy to have them come on and explain it because I just don't know. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Larry. It's a great to All chat right. with you. All right. Well, then I think we should probably tie things up now and talk about the conference that you were just at. You were the at what? the NACTL, the NACTL conference, right? That would be the National Association of Criminal Defense Lawyers. So when you sent it, I thought it had something to do with like dinosaurs, you know, nactyl, pterodactyl. So this was their ninth annual. They put on a continual legal ad uh, on, on a variety of topics all year long. They're, they're having an event every other month. And so they're well equipped. They've been around since 1958 and they're well equipped to, to do these. This is their ninth one in Las Vegas, defending sexual assault. And it's become such a complex area for people who defend these cases that they get together and have, have training. And this is our fourth, as the National Association for Rational Sexual Offense Laws, attending exhibitors to be there at that event because 415 attorneys were registered, or 415 legal professionals. They weren't all attorneys, but they had 415 people registered. So we attended as an exhibitor. Okay. Um, how, so you've been going, did you say four years? This was our fourth one. What is the, I mean, what is the purpose of going and talking to a bunch of attorneys? Well, the purpose we, we go there for is that trying to get 400 legal professionals together in one uh, venue where they deal with sexual crimes is hard to find. I mean, at our conference, for example, we might have six or eight, maybe 10 attorneys come to, to our conference. It puts us in the proximity of hundreds of legal professionals to try to bring them into our orbit. And what we're trying to do at NARSL is to 
form partnerships with these attorneys. Many of them are, are public defenders, and they can't do anything other than defend people accused of crimes. And in that in that regard, those really don't come into the, to our orbit the way we would like them to do. We we want them to provide good defense. They would want to be partners that encourages public policy that provides adequate resources for public defense. But but the ones we're really zeroing in on is those who not only provide public defense, but may consider legal challenges. Well, a public defender would only be able to do a constitutional challenge in the, in the course of a defense of a, of a client. Uh, a, a, a private attorney would be able to do constitutional challenges, civil action outside of those parameters. And we're trying to find attorneys that would be willing to partner with us to identify litigation that offers the opportunity for the greatest chance of success. And we want to start picking away, uh, uh, plucking down more apples off of the tree of things that are that should not be happening. It goes into our can they do that segments that we do so often and people have ca calls with questions about can they do it? Well, we would like to be able to throw more obstacles up to things that people are doing, but that requires partnerships. So that's what we're doing there. We're, we're poaching their attorneys to try to bring them, lure them into our orbit. Got it. Um, how many? How many? Did you say how many attorneys go though? Uh, Four hundred and fifteen people registered. Wow. Okay. Uh, half, half a dozen to a dozen didn't show, which is typical with a conference. So with with that, our, over the course of the two days, we interacted with probably approaching a hundred people. We didn't run an exact count, but we collected distance cards and contact information for I know approaching forty, which is ten percent of the attendance, which is which is pretty good. For example, on the on the treatment conference in Vancouver, we collected about the same number with a conference that was three times the size. But but the, that was the first time we've been at ATS. So this is the fourth time uh, people are getting more familiar with seeing us there. And they're perking up more to our argument because we're saying not only do we want to partner with you, we have we have a, a small amount of legal uh, we have legal resources as far as other partner attorneys, but we also have funds. And we can seed some of these challenges in terms of the out-of-pocket costs that an attorney or a law firm would have to put out that would that would dissuade them from undertaking a, a particular case because cases can be expensive if they require expertise and depositions. So the attorney has to be willing to give up his billable hours for however long the litigation may go on. Plus, they have to be willing to convince their family or their partner uh, in the case of a, of, of a partnership law firm, that we're willing to put out thousands of dollars of case-related costs. And NARSL has funding available for carefully screened cases that we can enter into an agreement with the attorney to provide those funds, and then we, we recover on the backside if the case is successful. Well, as you can imagine, we've tried to make very uh, a good analysis of the case to make sure that we believe the chances of success are pretty good because if we dump in thousands of dollars like we did in Rhode Island, we put $15,000 in to the, to the case fund to help the ACLU fight that uh, uh, retroactive residency restriction that was going to force people from their homes. We hope that when that case finally concludes the trial and appellate process, we get that money back with a successful victory, and then that would go into another challenge somewhere else. Don't. I, I, so, I mean, we have, you know, like rock star kind of attorneys. So King Alexander is readily willing to volunteer to, to push for our cause. You've got someone out there in Cali, like uh, Janice Bellucci that are on the front lines, bringing these cases out. Um, and I guess maybe even Paul Dubling in North Carolina falls into that camp as well. I, I have to think that there are attorneys on the other side that are on the victim's advocate side too, right? Well, the, 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 the battle we fight is generally with the state uh, attorney general's office in terms of any state challenge. Like, for example, we're we're trying to find an, a, a partner in Georgia to do the Halloween sign restriction where right. they posted the signs. Uh, if we file that lawsuit, if we're successful in initiating that lawsuit, it's going to be defended uh, by, by the governmental apparatus. It'll either be the uh, the county uh, attorneys in Spalding and, and Butts County or I, I don't know who I, it's it's premature to say exactly who will name us defendants, but since this is not a state statute, it'll probably be county attorneys. But generally, you're fighting the state because the state has mandated most of these requirements that we're fighting about. In the case of those two in Georgia, those were unilateral actions by sheriffs without any supporting county or state authority. 
but but we're usually fighting people that are well funded because they're working from the taxpayer resources. Yes. And <laughs> and then I'm also going to guess and then like at the county level at this uh for the Georgia sheriff thing, they wouldn't they wouldn't have unlimited funds and not to say unlimited, but just some big coffer. They would have severely reduced butts is not a big county, neither Spalding. It would be interesting as we'll find out like in in my state they would have they would have the necessary resources because the the New Mexico Association of Counties would be would be the would be the party that would be defending the county in an action like that. But Georgia may be different. It may be that their contract county attorney does it, or they may farm it out to to uh, the contract county attorney. It may not be up to speed, and they may farm it out to a, to an expensive law firm, and it may become expensive. But our goal is to to find litigation that's winnable and to bring it. The magic silver bullet that brings down the registry is not there. Um, it's very frustrating, disappointing for me to have to tell people that, but there, there's, there's no silver bullet. There's going to be a series of continuing challenges to chip away and draw boundaries of how far they can go and push these, uh, push some of these successes back. But the, the registry is going to end when the public no longer wants it. That's when the registry is going to end. The courts are not going to end the registry because, as I've said on previous podcasts, they can't in the registry. Merely registering people is not unconstitutional. It's what you require of them in the registration process that pushes it over the edge. You could have a registration of sexual offenders that would not be punitive at all, and it would not be unconstitutional. We don't advocate for such a thing, but it could be done. You could put everybody on a list and require them to mail in a form once a year and say, go on and have a great life. You can do anything anybody else can do. It would be hard to imagine that would be con- unconstitutional because there'd be it's no really, punitive. There'd be no punitive aspect of it. Right, right. I'm with you. Yeah, I, I, you've you've definitely opened up my eyes to to the extent of of the nuances. I guess is the right word to to portray this of where it fits in. But then ultimately, how does this apply to other things? Um, you know, we can bring up a driver's license. Where yeah, you go to re- register your driver's license. But the penalties for not are nowhere near what the penalties are from the registry side of things. Where, you know, if you don't go renew your driver's license on time, no one's going to come hunt you down. But if you miss your registration by minutes or hours, they are going to send the SWAT team out for you. And that is an argument that people frequently raise that hasn't gained traction yet. And I'm not ruling that one as one that might gain traction. Because analyzing the regulatory schemes that exist, when you look at this so-called regulatory scheme, the, the, the penalties for failure to, co- to comply are so disproportionate compared to other regulatory schemes. I think that might be some place where you can gain traction, but that doesn't mean you get rid of the regulatory scheme. That means you bring the penalty scheme down. That doesn't make the reg- regulatory scheme itself unconstitutional. Then uh, let me just introduce this. Um, I, I almost forgot to cover the article. Um, I have this little clip. There's this, uh, I, I don't really, like he's a progressive Rush Limbaugh, but he's not an asshole. And he his name is David Packham. And he has a, uh, a little clip. It came out about a week ago. Then, uh, and here's, I just, I'm just going to play about 10 seconds of it. And I am now ready to say that Beyond the question of the legality or morality of any post-sentence repercussions, I'm also specifically against the sex offender registry, and I want to talk to you about that today. The best argument I can make for the sex offender registry is that sex offenses are a type of crime that present such a risk to society, such a risk to children, that we should handle them specially compared to, for example, burglary or tax fraud so that neighbors can look you up to see if you are around and be aware of the danger that you present. And I really spent a long time looking into this and it doesn't really make any sense. It's not a good argument. Number one, I have found no evidence that sex offender registries actually help to reduce the number of sexual assaults. That's the, I've just found no evidence of that whatsoever. Number two, when I dug into what makes up sex offenses as yeah. a- and, I'll, and i'll stop it there um so, and this guy has a i mean there's 928 comments on this youtube page as of now and this little video clip of five minutes has fifteen thousand views this guy gets some pretty good traction this was published on november 4th and you can find a link to it in the show notes uh i i mean 
he he presents just like well if it doesn't provide any a level of public safety and you're just tagging people with a scarlet letter and shaming them and making their life hell what's the point is that who we are as americans it's really it's worth going to listen to and would give you more or less all the talking points that you could ever need to give to uh if someone is opposed to all of this well i think we should invite him to our conference uh i think that would be an outstanding idea he might require some funding though i'm just gonna guess well i think that would be something we could consider and then the i heard that some of our affiliates are, are ready to contribute to that so we're, we're looking at us at a speaker fund that would be supported by affiliates and foundation, the the the, the Narsal Foundation. Uh, so yes, we're looking at that. Outstanding. Um, well, you know, Larry, I have a, another little piece of news to spring on you. I uh, I messed around with like an online store today, and if you would like to get Registry Matters merchandise, that is now a thing. You can get uh, mugs, or you could get T-shirts, ball caps, totes. You can get all kinds of stuff. What do you think about that idea? Well, I, I love it. Have you made your first purchase? I, I haven't yet. I did it this morning, and uh, I just sent you a link to it. There, there. You heard you heard his phone buzz. Uh, and uh, so yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna order some stuff. I'm probably gonna order a uh, a ball cap or something like that. So was I'm that gonna, my fo- was gonna, that my was that my phone buzzing? Yes, that was your phone that just went off. Uh-huh. I sent you a link. And uh, outside of that, I really don't have anything else to do uh, with this other than to tell you people how you can share it. Oh, one other little announcement. Uh, Going to be traveling over the next week or so. Probably, most likely, won't be recording another episode over uh, over next weekend. So we'll skip a week uh, for Thanksgiving, and that'll probably also happen over Christmas also. And if the uh, partner of the p- podcast was sophisticated enough, he could do it by himself, but he's not, and he can't. <laughs> I, I mean, if you really want to make it happen, we can make it happen. Uh, <laughs> but, so. you know, visit the website, registrymatters.co, and you can call in and leave feedback or questions or voicemail at 747-227-4477. The email address is registrymatterscast at gmail.com and that's not cast as in like the cast of characters that's cast as in podcast but it's the same word just different meaning and then obviously the best way to support the show is at patreon.com slash registry matters and with that i bid you adieu and i will talk to you very soon larry thanks andy have a good night good night